Some time ago, I was visiting one of England's beautiful cathedrals. And as I stood at the centre of this wonderful Gothic building, looking upwards at the great soaring stone arches bathed in light from above, I became transported into a world of wonderment and joy. This does happen when you are in a sacred space. One of the priests who was passing asked me, are you looking for something? Without thinking, I said, yes, I'm looking for myself. He replied, that's fine, I'll leave you to do that. And it occurred to me afterwards that I was not there by accident. Some voyage of discovery had led me there. I had made a pilgrimage to that sacred space without knowing it. I had been following those beacons of light that accompany us on our voyage through life, beacons that helped to light the path, and that sacred space was for me only a stopping point on a much bigger journey, the journey of my whole life. Brethren, today I want to take you on a pilgrimage, the journey of your life, a journey on which you may learn to look at things from a different angle, from a different perspective. It's a journey that uses allegory, allegory that hints at aspects of yourself and the world around you that you may never have explored until now. It's a journey on which you may learn to look beyond the obvious. It's the journey of Freemasonry. In one of the pamphlets written by my Grand Lodge for Seekers After Truth, for non-Masons interested in finding out more, we learn that Freemasonry, quote, teaches moral lessons and self-knowledge through participation in a progression of allegorical plays learnt by heart and performed within the Lodge. But that, brethren, is only the beginning. Freemasonry requires a belief in God, and therefore, as we understand it, it is a spiritual pursuit. I submit that such a pursuit cannot be followed by sitting still and reading about the subject. You and I know that you cannot become a Freemason merely by reading a book about Freemasonry. Freemasonry has to be experienced. You have to get down and do it. And as you immerse yourself in Freemasonry, as its ancient lessons and insights envelop you and guide you and guard you, you are constantly gaining new angles, new perspectives. Perspectives on yourself, perspectives on your fellow men and on your universe. In short, you are going on a journey of discovery. Since the beginning of time, man has been on a journey. It is not in his nature to remain still for long, nor to confine himself to one homestead or place of work. Man is by nature a searching, questing being. Primitive man was obliged to travel to seek new sources of food or to avail himself of greater safety in his surroundings, safety from natural hazards as well as safety from enemies. But travelling was itself hazardous. The very word travel comes to us through the French travail, meaning work, and an archaic English meaning of the word travail, a word still used in the Christian liturgy today, was that of peaceful effort, trouble and work. So man's natural urge to travel was also accompanied by difficulty, by testing and by tedium. And as he travelled, he learned. As he travelled, he was constantly subjected to changes of environment, changes of perspective, constantly arriving at new ways of looking at things. Today, I would like you to submit yourselves to a change of perspective in your Masonic pursuit. The artist and illusionist M.C. Escher took great delight in contriving impossible images or rather images of situations which appeared possible but were in fact not so. Situations which were in fact pure illusion. We've probably all seen this illustration of an impossible triangle. <coughs> we can view any two of the legs of this figure and they make sense. The left and right ones at the top taken together, if you shut out the bottom one, it's perfectly feasible. Or if you shut out the bottom one and the right one, that's feasible. But all three of them taken together present us with an apparently impossible puzzle. 
This image is Escher at his very best. The monks ascending and descending this winding staircase are all going nowhere. After they believe they've reached the summit, they're still ascending. And those who are descending never reach the bottom. But these monks are part of the experience. They cannot know that what they're doing is unreal, is illusory. However, there is one monk um, standing on the terrace lower down on the left-hand side. Do you see him with his back? He's leaning against the wall. Who, being a detached, impartial observer, is privileged with more insight. He alone can see that the other monks are going nowhere at all. And he can do this because he is employing all the perspectives whereas the monks going up and coming down the staircase have only the perspective of the view ahead of them. Happily, we in Freemasonry have a much less complicated winding staircase and one where you do eventually reach the summit. This is an illustration of part of the second degree tracing board used in the emulation ritual. I'm sure you are acquainted with it because I've seen lots of illustrations of it around. But the Freemasons ascending this winding staircase know very precisely where they are coping to go. They have a real purpose. Our winding staircase provides us with a good example of changing perspective, of allowing us to look at one object from different angles. We have the allegory of a change of scenery where we see first one wall ahead of us, then a second as we turn the corner, then the top of the staircase, then a door beyond that. As we journey in any medium, we experience a change of scenery. I would like you to think now, for a moment, how our order started life in the 18th century. Picture for a moment a group of men, powdered wigs, knee breeches, swords, brocade or damask coats, lace ruffs and all the other elements belonging to the imagery of that century, grouped together round a lodge carpet on which are depicted some of the emblems of the ancient art, and the initiate, still blindfolded, standing at the west end facing east, about to be led up to the altar to take his obligation. Impress that image on your mind for a moment. If you are not a Freemason and had never heard of Freemasonry, you would wonder what was going on. But all I am describing to you here could be any one of the many old engravings that are to be found in any number of Masonic exposés of that period. And while you have that image in your mind, consider that, in those days, the vast majority of lodge meetings were held not to conduct a degree ceremony at all, but rather to go on a journey of learning to engage in moral, philosophical and intellectual debate, discourse and exposition. Let's think again about the 18th century, the Age of Enlightenment. This was an age when men were learning to loosen the shackles imposed on them by the ruling classes and by the church. It was an age in which the citizens of France dared to think about throwing off the yoke of the tyranny of the aristocracy and ridding themselves of a greedy monarchy. It was an age in which the citizens of your own country dared to think of independence from the oppressive English government they were subject to. I've used the words dared to because this was the age in which the philosopher Immanuel Kant, frustrated that the clergy and the scholars still guarded jealously the right to tell men how and what to think, issued a call. Immanuel Kant's call was a call to the greatest freedom man would gain since Magna Carta. In what became a battle cry of the Enlightenment, Kant said loud and clear, Audi sapere. Well, he said it loud enough, but being in Latin, it may not have been all that clear. Audi sapere, dare to know. Nowadays, having read Kant's work, we might use modern English and say something like, have the courage to use your own reason, your own questing mind, and not simply to parrot the learning imposed upon you by others. In the 18th century hothouse of moral and intellectual striving, where the search for truth took precedence over everything, Freemasonry took its rise. 
Lodges became the haven for men eager to give expression to freedom of thought, who could do so without fear of censure from the authorities. The membership of lodges in those days, we must remember, on both sides of the Atlantic, was dominated by true radicals, revolutionaries. Now, let's fast forward to today. Today, when a person comes to Freemasonry for initiation, it is very likely that before his initiation, he has little real concept of what is required of him. This organisation he is going to join, he may know that it has charitable and philanthropic motives, but what does that entail? What will be required of him in particular? He may may also be apprehensive. He has heard something about blood-curdling oaths to swear, but after all, his sponsors seem to think he will be alright, so there is probably no need to worry. He has some vague notion that he will have to learn a lot of rules about correct behaviour, protocol and so forth, and it is possible that he has even heard something about ritual. But, he may ask himself, what is this Freemasonry thing? Above all, is it a static philosophy, one in which nothing much will be required of him except simply to sit there and listen? Or is it, on the other hand, a dynamic pursuit, one in which his faculties will will be put to the test, tested if not physically, then at least intellectually or morally? Well, On the surface, Freemasonry may appear to be either one or the other, depending on your point of view. Freemasonry, after all, has no dogma. In everyday practice in Freemasonry, there is no right or wrong way to do things. The central points of our Masonic Code are, of course, immutable and unchangeable, but may be recognised by a visitor to a foreign Grand Lodge, despite differences in detail, and I've noticed a few myself today. But what may be good Masonic practice in one country or jurisdiction may well be regarded as unacceptable in another. So, that which our new aspirant finds when the blindfold is removed will become for him or her standard Masonic practice. He will know nothing different. He may have the misfortune to be initiated in what I would call a social and dining lodge, and if that is so, there may then be great importance placed on his membership of Freemasonry being a civic attainment or on using his membership to get to know as many members as possible who can be of use to him in his business or his career or importance placed even on gaining a high Masonic rank as quickly as possible. In such a scenario there will be little for him to study and what there is will be of the most superficial kind.